שלום רבותיי, אני רוצה לפתוח את האירוע של היום. ראשית אני רוצה לברך את כל האורחים המכובדים שהגיעו זה עתה, את הסטודנטים ואת הפרופסורים שנמצאים פה. תודה שבאתם לבוקר החשוב הזה. רות ארנון לא נמצאת פה היום. Uh, ובמקומה אני רוצה לקרוא למאיר צדוק uh, כדי לשאת דברי פתיחה. עברית או אנגלית? אני לא יודע איפה, בת שבע היה בוסית. אנגלית. אוקיי. אבל גוד מורנינג אביבודי. אני מאוד פליז לפתוח את הראשון הזה היום. Uh, unfortunately, as you know, Professor Ruth Arnon is at the moment in New York. Her uh, sister passed away. I'm not going to replace her, don't worry. It will never happen. Maybe next generation, but not this one. Uh, I want to welcome, first of all, the Adams family and Gil Troy, Linda, Sylvan, and Sylvan's wife, Margaret. And uh, we are very happy to see you here. With the years, uh, I think the Adams has integrated into the life of the academy, and it has become one. Uh, we feel so comfortable that we are informal. Most of us have no ties, but more personal ties and in terms of the feeling. And we haven't yet quarreled, but it's still a family, I think. We feel very, very comfortable with you. And uh, I don't know how much uh, you know, but uh, I think this is the only um, ceremony that takes place where we allocate funds and fellows. This is only for the Adams. Usually the Academy refrains from uh, giving prizes. So, so this is it's very prestigious in terms of the Academy. And uh, with the years, it has become part of our life, even families and, and people that uh, we know each other. I want to thank uh, the Academy members who attend. Uh, Professor Amiram Grimbald is going to run the whole day here, Professor Chaim Sidar and Professor Moshe Oren, who are sitting here. Um, and of course, I want to thank the Adams Fellows. As you know, it's been more than 10 years that we are having this event. And with the years, we have more and more Adams Fellows. It's the most prestigious, we think, of a PhD for science that uh, has been given in Israel. And uh, we wish all of you luck and success in the future. Few things about the Academy. The Academy main function is in fact by law to be um, assigned to look after research and to ensure the quality and excellence of science. And uh, what the Academy did in the past, and especially in the last 30 or 40 years, we are more and more geared to uh, raise funds uh, the Academy established the Israel Science Foundation, the Academy established TELEM, a number of actions that we took that are essential for the excellence of science in Israel. Uh, well, I cannot without some informal stories because when we talk about it, uh, Marcel is going to be 95 years old and I always remember the first meeting with him, I was telling some of my colleagues here how we met. And you know, with the years we were raising funds from donations and I was preparing to um, be a bit formal when we met him. And then I realized that he speaks Hebrew and he feels very well at home here. And we tried to introduce him. At that time, Professor Efraim Katsir was still alive and uh, we invited uh, Marcel to see Efraim Katsir and uh, we had Menachem Ya'ari who was president-elect, Professor Yoshua Yorkner, and me. And I guess I'm sorry that we didn't uh, took a picture or we didn't record it, but it was probably one of the most touching moments that I ever uh, um, seen, where the two of them were sitting, and it turned out that they had stayed in the same kibbutz in different years. Uh, this was very, very touching. And for me, you know, it's more, we have donations, you have activities that happen from time to time, but there are very few things, there are few donors who feel 
that they are following it, feel it, and want to see how it works. And I'm very pleased to see, to open this morning, and, and I want to thank my um, staff, the mother of all the program, Bacheva, who sits here, and well, I, th I thought next generation, I want to be one of the fellows to be one, to feel how she treats you, how she makes sure that uh, you are part of what's going on. And uh, I wish all of us a nice day. As, you, as I said, feel very comfortable to come to us if you have things that you feel that we should know. And uh, we hope to run this year after year. And we wish we'll have, of course, a ceremony in the afternoon. Uh, but from here, we want to send our best regards to Marcel. And uh, this is the first time that you didn't attend. We wish you health, the most important things. And we wish you him good years. And uh, we hope to see him maybe next year. Thank you. And we should have a nice morning. Amiram, please. Thank you very much. It is my uh, great uh, pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Howard Seder as the next uh, speaker and the only speaker of uh, the day about uh, science. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure uh, if uh, Chaim needs an introduction, but for those who don't know uh, Chaim, I, I will just read to you what was uh, uh, published. Uh, in the book of the meeting. So uh, Chaim uh, works on the mechanisms that control the, de the development of the diverse collection of cells that uh, constitute the human body. Actually, development is a marvelous uh, topic. Uh, at least it's beyond my comprehension, because it looks like a miracle, and certainly God is involved. But uh, some scientists managed to shed important uh, uh, light and uh, gain better understanding of uh, the mechanism. So uh, the, the magic is that there are uh, many, many different uh, cell types in our body. Each of them produces, uh, uh, is uh, composed of a different uh, factory that uh, create the substances which are required for uh, normal function. And how all of this uh, go to the right place uh, in the right time during uh, development is a major problem in uh, biology. Of course, everybody knows that the DNA is uh, responsible for that, but there are no many clocks in the DNA and how the hell uh, this uh, diversity is uh, accomplished. So uh, in the late uh, 70, uh, Chaim uh, discovered that uh, there is a very simple uh, molecule that uh, combined to an uh, important site in the huge molecule of the DNA. And that sm small molecule sort of inactivate that uh, portion and the instruction that are usually encoded in that portion to which the, this uh, methylation uh, occur. Uh, does not function uh, anymore, so this is a, a nice way to achieve a, a spell, cell uh, a specificity uh, during the development. Uh, <coughs> this is a, a major uh, discovery, and uh, therefore it's no wonder that uh, Chaim received many awards, including the Israel Prize, uh, the Wolf Prize in uh, Medicine, the Emet Prize uh, and the, the Gerdner uh, International Award and the Rothschild Prize. I think there are some more to uh, come. So I think it would be more interesting to hear about the science from Chaim himself, and uh, I invite you to the podium, Chaim. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, before I start, I just want to say one thing, the only thing I'm going to say in Hebrew, and that is, as you all know, today is Yom Yerushalayim. i just like to say Chag Sameach to everybody. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is basically a talk about language. 
And the language I'm going to talk about is the language of the DNA. And for some of you, the biologists here, some of the things I'm going to say may sound a little bit simple, but hopefully um, we'll all be able to understand how this language of DNA is employed, especially in animal cells and in people. So the story basically starts when we ask, what are the components of the body? How is the body made up? We all know that the body is made up of proteins. An example of a protein is shown right here. This is the iris of the eye. And you can see it has this blue color. Okay. And this blue color is a pigment, which is a protein. Um, one of the things that makes up the iris of the eye. In this particular case, the protein provides color. The protein can also provide other functions in the cell. So here's another example of a protein. This is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is found in red blood cells. And it's this protein which is responsible for carrying oxygen all over the body. This protein knows how to bind oxygen in the lungs. And it knows how to release it in the different places in the body. It's a complex protein. It does a lot of things. It involves bending and attaching and grabbing and releasing, all sorts of functions. And this, this is a protein. It's actually four, two different proteins put together. But this is another function of a protein. So where do these proteins come from? These proteins have to be made by our cells. And in order for them to be made, there has to be a source of information. And that source of information is our genetic material, which we receive from our parents. And just to give you a feeling for how it works, this booklet that we receive from our parents is a book in all respects. It has a language. The language is made up of letters and words and sentences and paragraphs and even volumes of books. And if we look at the language, you can see here the language is uh, simple. It only has four letters, this language, A, T, G, and C. Okay. The words are very simple. Every word is three letters. So for instance, you'll see in a minute, A, T, G is a word. C, T, A is a word. Okay. And the words fit together to make a sentence. And each sentence basically is information for how to make a protein. And the way it works is as follows. Inside the cell, this is red. There's a complicated machinery, which is, again, made up of mostly proteins. For reading this information, starts off by reading the first word. That's a sign to introduce the first amino acid. Proteins are made up of a chain of amino acids. There are 20 different amino acids. And proteins are a combination of amino acids. So it introduces the first amino acid. Then it reads the next word, next amino acid, next word, next amino acid, and continues that way, reading the whole sentence. And once it's read the whole sentence, it's made a protein. Okay? And of course, each protein is different because the text for the protein is different. It's different in the sense that it has different amino acids. And it's different in the sense there's a different order. Okay? Now, once this protein is made, okay, the next step is a very important step. But it's a step that has to happen. The next step is that this protein starts to fold. And it folds and folds and folds until it reaches its state of equilibrium. And the reason why it folds is because all of these amino acids have charges and they have structures. And there is an interaction of forces. And that interaction of forces generates uh, the final protein, which in terms of biology is a shape. Okay? And, and so the, the, the language that we read is ultimately translated into a shape. And so an example would be, uh, we just saw this folded protein. This could be, for instance, this protein, or this combination of multimer multimeric proteins, which is a channel, a channel inside the membrane of the cell that allows materials to go in and out 
of the cell, made up of proteins. And what, what, what dictates this structure, basically, is the original sequence that's in the DNA. Another example are the proteins that make up the hair, the hair uh, hairs, right? And you notice here, I don't have an example to show you, but if you would look at this protein, how it folds, it folds a lot differently. It folds like this, in a rigid form. And that's why our hair is basically a rigid structure. It's basically because somewhere in the DNA is written a code for making a protein that will ultimately be translated and folded into a structure that makes up the hair. The same thing, for instance, with enzymes in the body. Enzymes that are responsible for carrying out chemical reactions have to be able to grab the substrates, have to be able to combine substrates, have to be able to release them, to bend. All those things are dictated by what's written in the DNA. And the truth is that with all the advances that we've, we've gone through in molecular biology, the code of how to translate the DNA language into structure is not yet known. Parts of it are known, but it's not yet known. And this is the ultimate aim of the DNA, and that is to produce structure and function. OK, so um, these sentences, or these proteins, these genes, as we call them, are, are located on bigger molecules so that on a big piece of DNA there could be a lot, a lot of genes. And of course, uh, these genes are organized into chromosomes. So every chromosome has a large number of genes that are spaced and put on, this, on the chromosome. And in every organism there are numbers divided up into volumes, into volumes of this encyclopedia. And and every organism has a little bit different organization, but basically the idea is the same. In man, we have 46 chromosomes. All of our genetic information is spread out over these chromosomes. And, and we get 23 from our mother and 23 from our father to make up our final genome, our final book. And this is not a simple book. I like to bring this example to show how complex, uh, simple on the one hand, but complex on the other hand, this DNA book is. And there are three billion letters in this book. Okay, this is for man. Okay. Um, this is a lot. You know, if, you, if you look at a page, for instance, a written page, it has 3, approximately 3,000 letters, an average page, which means a book with 1,000 pages would have 3 million letters. In order to get to 3 mil billion letters, you would have to have 1,000 of these volumes of the encyclopedia. And of course, all of this fits into the nucleus of every cell. Now. Now starts the problems. The problem is that when we get this DNA from our parents, we get the DNA in the form, half of it comes from the sperm, half of it comes from the egg of the mother. It combines to make a single cell, which has two copies of everything. And when that's, that cell is ultimately going to make the entire human being. And in the first step, it has to divide, but before it divides, it replicates. It has to copy all of the book so that there will be two books in order to put one in this cell and one in this cell. And then when they divide, they again have to copy the entire book in order to make four cells. And every time cells divide, they copy the book in such a manner such that in our body, which has something like a million billion cells, in every single cell, we have the original information that we inherited from our parents. Okay? And of course, there are a few mistakes along the way, <laughs> as Moshe can tell you. But it, basically, it's copied 
really, really accurate, much accurately, much more accurately than we can do. Uh, just for comparison, if you take a scribe who's writing uh, a Sefer Torah, right? There are only 600,000 characters in a Sefer Torah, and every, they always make mistakes. And this is much, much more accurate than that. It's a really amazing thing. Anyhow, as a result, every cell has the same book. Yet we know the whole basis of a human being, of any organism, any multicellular organism, is that all the cells are different. We have tissues and, and organs and different kinds of cells. The brain itself is, is, could be made up of thousands of different cell types. So, an example, here's an example of a, a, a nerve cell. Um, the, the, it's not green. This is, was done by a scientist to make it green. Okay. But look at the shape. First of all, it has a certain shape. It has these um, extensions, which are axons or dendrites. Um, now, and also this cell has certain functions. This cell knows how to communicate with other cells. And it might know how to communicate with muscles. Right. It has a whole set of proteins that it needs to make its, to, to, for its function, for its shape and its function. Right. Now, if we take a look at another cell type, anybody want to venture what cell this is? Not a blood cell. It's round, that's true. But yeah. So they, these are what we commonly call fat cells. Right. And you can see the cells around. They have a nucleus where the book is located. Okay? And all of this yellow that you see here is fat. And these cells basically store fat. Now, these cells have a different shape, and they have a different function. These cells need different proteins. They have proteins for uh, bringing in materials, for making complex fats, for, de for degrading the complex fats, for regulating when the fat comes in and when the fat goes out. All these require specific proteins that are made by this cell, and they're not made by the nerve cell. There's another example, a liver cell. You right away see they have a different shape. Right? They're attached to their neighbors as opposed to the fat cells. And again, these cells have different shape, different color, and they have different functions. The liver cell, most of what the liver does is to de detoxify things in the blood. It has other functions as well. This requires many, many, many different proteins, many different enzymes to do this that are only made by the liver. So <clears throat> as, uh, so, so basically, these cells are different. They make different proteins, yet they all have the same book. And many years ago, working together with uh, Professor Aaron Razin, we discovered one of the major mechanisms for doing, for solving this problem. And the way it works is as follows. It's very, very simple. So this is the text of the DNA. It turns out that the DNA can be annotated. And it can be annotated, of course, chemically. And there's only one annotation in mammalian DNA, and that is DNA methylation. And only C's are methylated. That's the only letter that gets methylated. And you'll see later that not only it's just C's, but it's just C next to G. Those are the only things that get methylated. But when this methylation is present on the DNA, it serves as a signal, as an annotation to the cell that this gene should not be read. Okay? So if we now look at the overall picture in a tissue, for instance, in tissues, we see the following. So here we have a gene. This is the gene for eye pigment. It's a sentence located in the book. Of course, this pigment gene is located in the iris of the eye. It's located in the liver. It's located in nerve cells. It's located in all the cells of the body. It's the same gene. But when you look at it at the level of annotation, it's different. So only in the iris of the eye is this gene unmethylated. Everywhere else, it's methylated. And as a result, the pigment is not made in the liver. 
It's not made in the nerve cells. It's not made in other cells. It's only made in the iris of the eye. Another example, the gene for albumin. Albumin is probably the most abundant protein in the body. It's made by the liver. The gene is located in every cell. But if you look at the level of the annotation, you'll see that it's methylated everywhere almost. But only in the liver, it's unmethylated. And so this is the way it works. It's a system of annotation. I mentioned before that DNA is a language, like every language. And indeed, in terms of annotations, it's also a, 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 also a member of the family of languages. Okay. So just to give you an example, we use annotation all the time. This is a text from the abstract of a grant that I'm writing. And all the time, I annotate it by crossing things out or adding things. Okay? And this is a form of annotation. Okay? The best, best example of annotation comes from what we call the holy text, really the best form. So this is a copy of a page from the uh, Damascus Codex. Okay? in Keter the Methic. Uh, the book itself is over a thousand years old. Okay. It's located in our library, in the National Library, by the way. Anybody wants to see it? It's an amazing, this doesn't do it just, even though it looks beautiful, it doesn't do it justice. It's an amazing book. Okay. And what you see here is a text from uh, the Torah. Okay. And uh, it's OK, so this is the text. Now, if you look carefully at this copy, okay, it's actually composed of two components. It's composed of letters. What happened? It's, it's composed of letters okay, and words. But it's hard to read. What makes it readable are the annotations, right? the ends of the sentences the vowels, how to read it, where to put the accents, all in Hebrew is all through annotations. Right? And basically, DNA has the same thing with methylation being the chief annotation of the DNA. OK, so now let's try and understand where this methylation comes from. Okay. So I mentioned that we receive our, our our genetic information from our parents. So we get genetic information from the father, genetic information from the mother. Of course, when it comes from the sperm and the egg, it has methyl groups all over the place because the egg and the sperm are also cells. And they also have differentiated functions. So they have methyl groups in different places in the genome. But all of that is erased. All of those annotations are erased early on during development. And then, at about the time of implantation, when the embryo is implanted into the uterus, the methylation pattern is regenerated. And it's done in the following manner. There are regions that we call CPG islands. The name is not important. But they are going to remain unmethylated. So the whole genome gets methylated. And these regions remain unmethylated. Just to give you a hint, we're going to talk about it a little bit later, but just to give you a hint, these are basically genes that are, have housekeeping functions. These are genes that are going to be expressed in every cell of the body. So right from the beginning, they're set up to be unmethylated. Right? They're set up to be readable. Whereas everything else in the genome basically gets closed by this DNA methylation. Now, this is a one-time event. It happens at the time of implantation. But then the cells start dividing. Then we start getting an organism. The cells divide. They stop being pluripotent. They and stop being general cells and start differentiating. And when they divide, 
they have a way of remembering the methylation pattern. Just like they copy the text, they copy the annotation. And it's done in a very, very simple manner, okay? real chemistry. So if we take a look at DNA, DNA has two strands to it. As you can see, here's a CG that's methylated. Here's a CG that's not methylated. Okay? This is just to give you an example of methylated and unmethylated. Okay? If you look carefully, you'll see that these sites are symmetrical, so that you, know, you read DNA from left to right on the top strand and from right to left on the lower strand. So here's is a CG, and here, if you read this way, there's also a CG. Okay? And they're both methylated. So this is what DNA looks like. This is a methylated site. This is an unmethylated site. Watch what happens when the DNA gets replicated. Right? Before division, before the generation of a new cell, it gets re replicated. And you have this strand gets copied. Okay? So it gets copied. And that generates this site, which is half methylated, or we call hemimethylated. And then there's an enzyme that recognizes these sites. This enzyme is a meth can methylate. It can't methylate this. It doesn't recognize it. It only, only recognizes this. As a result, it'll methylate that. But it won't methylate this. Also, the same th thing is true for the other cell. The DNA is copied. It generates a half-methylated site. There's an enzyme that recognizes this half-methylation and fills in the methylation. And the result is that whatever the methylation pattern was of the mother cell, the original cell before it divided, it's copied to the daughter cells. So now these cells have the same pattern. Okay? So the idea is at the beginning of development, there's a process of methylation. This process turns off, basically turns off everything and leave some things open. Those things that are open are going to be genes or sentences that are going to probably be used all over the body. But that's a one-time event. After the, and then it's preserved. So if we now look in a, an adult, okay, if we take these are these could be these are tissues, brain, liver, muscle, colon, taken from a person who's 70 years old, not me, somebody else. And what we've done here is lined up all of these CPG islands, all of these regions that get protected. Okay? And so now you look, and here's a list of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, down to 13,000 of them. And blue indicates not methylated. Yellow indicates methylated. So every tissue. In brain, and th these are multiple samples from different people, liver, muscle, colon. You see, all of these things are basically unmethylated in this 70-year-old man, whereas all the other sequences are completely methylated. So this pattern, basically, was established 70 years earlier. And it was remembered throughout every cell division. Okay? I'm emphasizing this because one of the things that you should remember is that methylation is a memory, a mechanism of memory. OK. Getting into your field a little bit. OK, now what happens then? So here, in, in schematic form, I'm going to show you what happens because I've left out a very, very important thing here. Okay? I've left out the question of how these regions are protected. How is this pattern established? How does the cell know that this is a protected region as opposed to the other regions? Okay. So it works as follows. So this is the genome. Okay. So these are the genes. These are the sentences. Okay, every yellow here is a sentence. And now I'm going to tell you that not only are these their genes, 
But next to every gene, there are sequences. There's DNA, there are letters that are, have a regulatory function, have ide identification function. Okay? So all those genes that are going to remain unmethylated okay, are marked with a sequence which here I've designated as red. Okay? So here's a red, this is a sequence of DNA, a couple of letters of DNA that tells the cell that this is a CPG island, that this is going to remain unmethylated. So there's one here, this gene has it, and this gene has it. So now, when the de novo methylation comes along, everything gets methylated, but the system recognizes this sequence and leaves these regions unmethylated. First step. Okay. Next step. As development proceeds, we start making different organs, different tissues. Okay? So I'm going to give you an example of two different tissues, a blue tissue and a purple tissue. Okay? This could be liver and lung, or colon, or brain, or something else, skin. Okay? So this is a blue tissue. The genome looks like this. The annotation, everything is methylated at the beginning, okay? except for these three regions, which were marked with red. Remember? And now, some of these genes are going to undergo demethylation, I'm going to remove the methyl groups, because those genes are needed for that tissue, for that cell type. Okay? How does the cell know how to do that? It knows how to do that because these genes are marked. The genes that are needed in the blue cell are marked with a sequence that indicates that. In this case, I've designated it with a blue. Okay? So this gene and this gene have blue, and as a result, during development of the blue tissue, there's a pro that's recognized, and there's a process of demethylation. In the purple cell, okay, those that are, are, are potential or supposed to undergo demethylation become opened up in the purple cell, okay, are marked with a different sequence, designated here as purple. And as a result, these two genes will undergo demethylation. Notice that it's a modular system. Here's a gene that gets demethylated both in blue and in purple simply by putting the right sequence next to it. Okay? So how does the methylation pattern get, get established? It gets established because it's written in the genome. It's written in the book. The book has the information. So what does the DNA methylation do? What the DNA methylation does, it provides stability. It provides memory. Decisions that are made early on, on the basis of sequence, that maintains a memory of what it should be. Okay? So for instance, these genes that are being turned on Okay. Once they've undergone demethylation, they're in an open structure. They're easy to use, easier to use. Okay. So this is a system for memory. Okay. And I, I keep saying that this is a language like all languages, and indeed, we have an equivalent type of thing in, uh, in the languages that we use. It's, I love this example. So here you have a page from a uh, Siddur, from a prayer book. Right? And the prayer book is basically made up of information, like not, not proteins, but prayers. So here you see a prayer, and here's a prayer, and here's a prayer, and here's the beginning of another prayer. It's a whole list of prayers, like the DNA is a list of proteins. Right? But notice that sometimes in the prayer book you see things like this. Right? And this is not a prayer. It's an instruction. Okay? It's a sequence of letters, in this case a sequence of words, that doesn't tell you a prayer. It doesn't give you prayer information, right? But it tells you when and how to read the prayer. In this particular case, this little prayer over here is, only, is, is removed or not read two times a year, as indicated by this. Okay. 
Now, um, so this methylation process is very important during development. But because it's such a basic process, such a basic aspect of the language of DNA, this annotation, right, it also, of course, plays a role in other things. And one of the places it plays a very important role is in cancer. So um, I'll show you how it, what we think goes on. So this is a, 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 a tissue. You can see it's made up of cells. What I want you to notice about these cells is that they're very well organized and they're very well be. This is a normal tissue. This could be a liver. Right? Normal tissue, you see the cells really are lined up nicely like soldiers. I can tell you that these cells don't divide a lot. They respect their neighbors. They don't break off and go other places in the body. They don't release any proteins or uh, toxins. They're very, very well behaved. Okay? But as a result of mutations, as a result of substances that seem to affect the DNA and make changes in the DNA in a few places, these cells can become tumors. Okay? And when they become tumors, what happens is the cells stop behaving normally. So first of all, they start dividing more frequently. They start, you can see the structure, the, the, the organization gets a little bit messed up. Then they start changing how they divide. They can change their shape. They can start secreting substances. They can become ugly until they form a tumor. So now if you ask yourself, what's the difference between the normal cell and the tumor cell right, in terms of the DNA, in terms of the book? Right? So we know the book has been changed a little bit, because in order to get the tumor, you probably need a mutation. Or maybe you need a few mutations. It's a small number of changes. If you look at the two cells, the normal cell and the tumor cell, they behave radically differently. They have different patterns of expression. Different proteins are made. Other proteins, some are made, some are not made. And that has nothing to do with, with the mutation. There's a whole change in the regulation of how the DNA is read. And a large part of that has to do with DNA methylation. This cell goes from a normal cell with this pattern of methylation, of annotation. So this gene, let's say, is red, this not, this not, this is red, this not. Okay? As it converts to a tumor cell, did you catch it? Did you see the changes? <laughs> okay, let's do it again. It converts to a tumor cell, and watch what happens. Some sites undergo demethylation and some sites undergo new methylation. I'll do it again. This is methylated, it's become unmethylated. This is unmethylated, it's going to become methylated. Okay? Become methylated. Okay? So methylation plays a big role in how these cells behave. Okay? And I just want to show you an experiment that I didn't do, somebody else did, in which they took a mouse that has been genetically programmed, genetically programmed or genetically manipulated so that it always gets colon cancer, colon tumors. Every mouse gets colon tumors. In fact, it gets a lot of them. It gets about 175 to 100 colon tumors. Every mouse. You look in, after four or five months, it has these many, many tumors, every one. But if you give it a drug that inhibits methylation, this 5-azacytidine, and you give it in small doses from birth, once a week, small doses, look what happens. Instead of getting 75 to 100 tumors, you cut it down by two orders of magnitude. Okay? And this is because for this disease in the mouse, methylation is essential. Without, without that methylation, Okay? And you don't get the tumor. It's essential for the tumor. Okay. 
The next question that I want to ask and partially answer is the big question. This is the question that people call epigenetics. I'm sure you've all heard the word. And what epigenetics means is sort of on the side of genetics, additional to genetics. That's the idea. Okay? And usually it refers to DNA methylation. So the question is, Can our environment affect DNA methylation? Now the question is basically a, a philosophical, it, it starts off as a philosophical question, because basically Darwin said that the environment can't affect our genes. In other words, environment doesn't change our genes. Okay? If environment does something, it selects. So the mutations or the changes occur by themselves, and the environment selects for it. But the environment itself can't change what the genes do. So it can work at the level of evolution, perhaps, but what about the, the normal individual? Okay? The environment can affect our genes. DNA methylation is sort of like a shortcut in the sense that maybe the, the environment can affect methylation. And in that way, while it's not affecting the basic text of the genes, it can change how these genes are used. And in this way, environment may affect behavior, may, in fact, may affect how people are resistant to things, or how they react to certain things, how their metabolism might change with the food that they eat or the life that they lead. So this is a big question. Can the environment do it? And we, we really don't know the answer to this. But there are some hints, and I'm going to show you this, that, that it's true, that it can happen. Okay, so the first example I want to show you, this was an experiment that, that was done by um, Emma Whitlow from Australia. And what she did was we, she, she took these mice. This mice is called an agouti mouse. Agouti is a color. It's this yellow color. And what you see here is a litter from one mating of two mice that looked like this. And these mice are what we call in genetics isogenetic. They have exactly the same genes. It's like taking uh, identical twin brother and sister, if that's possible, <laughs> and mating them together. So all the genes are the same. Every gene, in every animal that's born, the genes, the text, is exactly the same. Okay? And this is what she got. We would have expected all the mice to look like this. And it turns out that some of them look a little bit browner, some of them a little more brown, and some of them really brown. And also, these get a little smaller uh, when they have more brown in them. They're different, even though they have exactly the same genes. And it turns out that what happens here is that where this gene is located, there's a region of DNA that is sort of halfway between being an island, being recognized that it should remain unmethylated, and a region that should be methylated. So what happens is, during development, sometimes it gets a little methylated, sometimes it gets a little bit more methylated, sometimes it doesn't get methylated. Right? Sort of stochastic. And as a result, some of the mice, here, so this is the gene, if it's unmethylated, you get the agouti color. If it's more methylated, you get lessening of agouti. If it's very methylated, you get almost no agouti color, just the brown. Now, this is interesting because it turns out that you can affect this by the diet that you give to the pregnant mother. So if you give the pregnant mother food that's rich in methyl groups or in the substances that provide 
the source for the methyl groups, you get animals more like this. You get all of them looking like this. And if you give the mother food which is uh, lacking, or which has a decrease in the amount of these kinds of foods, then they all come out this way. So here's a case where the environment of the pups inside the, the mother are being affected, are affecting the level of methylation. And in the end result is it affects the, the mouse. The mouse comes out different, even though it has exactly the same genetic information. You want me to stop? Yeah? OK, another two minutes? It's OK? You're not tired? OK, I'll give you another example of this. And this is work by a, a, a talented postdoctoral student in the lab. His name is Tsaki. And which gives you another feeling for this. Okay. We're not there yet. Okay? But I, I want to show you a direction. So what Tsaki did was to look at differences between male and female mice. And he looked in the liver. He took a look in the liver and he asked, are there differences in methylation between a male mouse and a female mouse? We wouldn't expect to see any differences, right? Why wouldn't we expect to see any differences? Because it's the liver. Why should it be any different? Anyhow, we found a whole bunch of sites like this that are not methylated or under-methylated. And it's interesting how this change comes about. Okay? So it turns out that at birth, all the mice look like this. These genes that are getting changed, they all look like this. They're methylated. Okay? And the gene is inactive. So if we look at its activity, it only has a little bit of activity. Then, at three weeks of age, the males start making or start secreting testosterone, the male hormone. Okay. So they get testosterone. And what the testosterone does is it causes the gene to, these genes to become demethylated. As a result of that, if we look at the mouse at an older age, in this case 20 weeks, it has a higher activity. Why? Because it underwent demethylation. Now, if you take this mouse, this male mice, mouse, and you castrate it, right? So it's not, it's not capable of making testosterone anymore. And now you ask, again, at 20 weeks old, now this mouse can't make a testosterone. As a result, it won't undergo demethylation. And as a result, the level will be very low. Like a female, by the way. This is what females look like. This is the level that females have. But notice what happens. If you now do the following experiment. You take a normal male mice, you give it testosterone. I mean, it has testosterone. As a result, these particular genes undergo demethylation. And now, at the age of 20 weeks, you castrate him. You take away his testosterone. What do you get now? It's unmethylated, but doesn't have testosterone. You still get it. You get activity. Why? Because the, the methylation, the original demethylation that happens is a memory. After that, it doesn't, doesn't matter that much whether he has testosterone or not. The gene will be active, or at least partially active, because the methylation provides a memory. Okay? So here's an example. And by the way, you can take a female and give her testosterone, and she'll also do the demethylation. So this is a case 
where the, uh, the mouse is also affected by environment, by its internal environment. Right? The male is different than the female because it has a different internal environment, testosterone. And the methylation, pro the methylation pattern is, uh, is affected by that. So I showed you in the liver, here's an, uh, here's an example in the brain, the cortex, the fr prefrontal cortex of the brain. Right? Males, unmethylated, these are different mice, three different mice, this is four or five different mice. Male, these sites are unmethylated and the female are methylated. And it, this occurs in many places in the body. Right? And it's all because of the testosterone. And what we think is, is how, you notice that I mentioned that there were specific places that this occurred. In other words, this process is programmed. There must be something in the genome that identifies these genes, just like I showed you. Not a blue sequence and not a purple sequence, but a, I don't know, Bordeaux sequence, which says, I am a gene that is affected by testosterone. And what we think is that this is a paradigm for what may happen with the environment. That the environment can impact on the internal hormones and factors in the body, okay, which the genome, the book, is programmed to identify. And as a result, the environment can impact on the methylation pattern and affect behavior. And that this can be done in a manner so that even if the environmental exposure happens once, the body will remember it, even when the original exposure goes away. Very early stage, but it looks like this is what's going to happen. This is, this is what's happening. And thank you very, very much. Mazal tov to all of you on your, on your wonderful work and your success. We're all very proud of you. Uh, keep up the good work. So uh, my question is this. Uh, in recent years, there has been talk about, I'm not sure what this uh, English term for that, hit uh, shel ta'im, Cell differentiation, thank you. So there's been talk about uh, making cells undifferent undifferentiate themselves so that they can be used uh, to treat other parts of the body and so on. Does that involve the remethylation of, of uh, could you talk about that? Or how, how do you recognize, I mean, after the cell has differentiated itself where it should be remethylated in order to, to go back? Thank you. So yes. The answer to the question is yes. And, and point out that the real, so, so basically this whole concept is based on stem cells. And what, what is a stem cell? A stem cell is a cell that basically hasn't differentiated yet. It's what we call pluripotent. It has the ability to differentiate into any cell type. Okay? And we grow these cells in the laboratory. Now, the stem cell originally, the, the original primary stem cell, are natural cells in the body. What are those cells? Those are the cells where the methylation has been erased, where they don't have a cellular identity in terms of the annotation. And that's the real stem cell, the real first stem cell. So what happens when, when people play with stem cells in the laboratory? So they take a cell, let's say a, a blood cell or a liver cell or a skin cell, and they put into it uh, proteins that make it go back to the original state. And that involves reprogramming of the methylation pattern. And then when the, those new stem cells get differentiated into a new cell type, that, again, involves reprogramming of methylation. That's a very, very important part of the process. So how do these, I mean, the cells differentiate itself, how do they know where the methylation, which not? I mean, some of the CDs are, some of the CDs aren't in a place that were methylated in the sense of 
So what hap what, I don't, the, que the answer to your question is that we don't know. Okay? But what I think happens is that when you take a fully differentiated cell and you add this cocktail that you know, scientists use, what the cocktail does is to, is to uh, initiate the program of the original time at implantation. Okay? So everything is programmed. And, and, you know, I'll give you an example. And I, I think this is the most amazing thing that, that people usually don't think about, but this is the amazing thing about the genome. And that is everything is programmed. I tried to get to that at the end when I said, even if the environment affects us, it has to be something that's already programmed into the, into the system to begin with. Otherwise, it won't happen. So what does it mean, program? I'll give you a, a small example. Okay? In making a muscle cell, so muscles are very complicated. It has lots and lots of different proteins that um, have to be made. And it has other proteins that have to be turned off. So how is it done? So one of the ways it's done is that there are things called master genes. So to make a protein, to make a muscle, there's a, a protein that sets in motion a program. It recognizes a lot of places in the gene, in the book, and it sets in, in motion a program to do it. It all boils down to one gene or two genes that can do it. Okay? In fact, in the old, old, old experiments, they showed that you can take, for instance, a, a, a fibroblast. Fibroblast is a, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Anyhow, it's a cell type. And you can put into it the master gene of muscles, and you'll convert the cell to a muscle cell okay. using this master regulator. Yeah, thanks for your good question. Yeah. Um, the discovery of the regulation is uh, really important and uh, impressive. And uh, quite uh, often, behind such uh, discoveries, uh, there are stories uh, of, uh, let's say, gossiping that are uh, of uh, interest to uh, young scientists. Uh, an example is the discovery of penicillin or uh, the discovery of uh, orientation sensitivity in the brain, in the visual cortex by uh, Nobel laureates. Did anything uh, like that, uh, which is worthwhile uh, discussing informally, uh, happen to you and to Professor Razin? The only, the only story that comes to mind is that at the very beginning, when we were doing the uh, first experiments, we were trying to prove that DNA methylation inhibits expression. In other words, part of this story is, is to actually show that if you take a gene and you artificially methylate it, that gene will be inactive. In other words, otherwise it's just a correlation. You have to show physically that it, that it works. So we, we planned an experiment like that. And in the old days, it took us a long, long time to do it. The system was very complicated. And after about a year that we were working on this project, it was 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And the student who was doing it came running into the lab. And he said, you won't believe this, but the, the, the key exam samples that I was that, that we need for this experiment, they fell on the steps. <laughs> so I said to him, I said to him, where? <laughs> I immediately went there, and there I saw that everything was spilled on the floor. But next to each tube, there was a little, a little dot of liquid. And I took a pipette, and I picked up all of those samples of liquid. <laughs> And we analyzed them, and it was great. We got the results, and it was a little bit dirty, but <laughs> it was a great experiment. There was a, along the way, there were lots of challenges, um, challenges from other people. 
people who didn't believe it, people who still don't believe it today. Um, and uh, it was challenging. In, in a sense, it was good because it made us strengthen the results. In a sense, it wasn't good because we were always had to defend ourselves. But uh, yeah, in the end, it turned out OK. Any other question? This is the last question. Um, you mentioned the role of methylation and de demethylation in cancer. Are there any current or possible treatments that take advantage of this knowledge? So um, there's this drug, um, bimethylcytosine, which is used widely in treating cancer. Uh, for some diseases, some types of tumors, it's used as sort of as a last resort. But in other types of tumors, uh, uh, particular types of leukemia, it's used as the, uh, the main treatment, a disease called MDS, myelodysplastic disorder, and myelodysplastic syndrome, MDS. And, but it, it, very interesting that this is, refers to what uh, Miram just said. About five years ago, somebody made an interesting observation that when you use this drug in the levels that we use for treating people, it basically doesn't work as something that affects methylation, but it works sort of as, as chemotherapy. But if you use the drug at 10 times lower doses, it does work as a demethylating agent. And now there's a whole slew of experiments in many, many different types of tumors using this with a, a large degree of success. So within the next couple of years, I'm hopeful that uh, this type of treatment, and there's also work going on in making derivatives of this drug that may be better and less toxic. It's a, it's, when you're using these doses, it's, it's hardly toxic at all. So there's some hope that it can be used. And, and my hope is, I think, in understanding the biology of how it works, which I didn't go into here, understanding the biology of how it affects tumors, I think that the way this drug should be used is in preventing cancer. But that's another story, a very complicated story. Can't go into it. Yeah. Thank you. And Moshe. I will want to add on that because it's a really a very interesting issue. So uh, perhaps the biggest cry in cancer therapy in the last two or three years is cancer immunotherapy. I mean, this is really where the major successes and the uh, kind of game-changing events are occurring, you can now uh, come up with ways of turning on the immune system of a patient against her or his tumor to attack and eradicate the tumor. There's a lot of excitement about that, and one interesting observation that has been made recently is we know that tumors learn to evade the immune system. They pretty much go under the radar. The immune system, in principle, should eradicate tumors. It's a very efficient mechanism to get rid of tumors. The vast majority of tumors that develop in our body never go on because they are eradicated by the immune system. It's only those rare exceptions that learn how to disguise themselves and hide from the immune system that survive, stay, and eventually go on to kill the patient. Now it turns, on, turns out that methylation, like every, which is important in everything in life, as Chaim just told us, is also a mechanism that is involved in the tumor cells hiding themselves from the immune system. So if you now take a patient that has a tumor treated with this very low dose of demethylating agents, this 5 other deoxycytidine uh, on its own, uh, this is done, let's say now, primarily it was done in the last case in lung cancer. It's also being done in other major types of solid tumors. On its own, very often uh, you see uh, relatively modest effects. But if you now combine this with this Immun cancer immunotherapy, this works miracles because the cancer cells now expose those cues that they hit by methylation and the reactivated new system now grabs on those tumors and eradicates them very rapidly. So this is...